All right, Cindy, welcome to this live coaching call. That's technically not live, but it will be when people listen to it back on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Of course. And I know that you've very kindly given me a background story yourself, but just for the context of the value of all the listeners as well, can you just give a brief background of what you're struggling with, what you've been through, because it's a lot, and then kind of where you are right now? Sure. Um, So I'm 48 years old, and I guess my earliest memories of sort of secret eating, or it wasn't really binge eating, but secret eating was around six. Um, And interestingly, I kind of remember that before the dieting, although quickly followed thereon, my mother put me on my first diet. So I was probably six or seven years old at that time. Um, And, you know, I, it traveled into bulimia in my teens um, and then was just really chronic dieting, binge eating back and forth for most of my life. Um, So I left the bulimia behind Um, But that continued to plague me. I had periods of time where I was following um, Overeaters Anonymous or other very strict um, programs, um, but really just chasing, you know, the same 20 pounds up and down on the scale for most of my life. Um, I would say if I look at my life kind of like a ladder, um, the problems gotten better and better Mm -hmm. over time. But the mental obsession is still just as strong. So while in terms of actively binging, um, it's a lot less than it used to be. But the mental obsession is still very fiercely kind of got a hold of me. Mm, Thank you for for sharing. And when you say the mental obsession is the same, but the physical has got slightly better. Why do you think the physical side of things has got better over time? I think that with wisdom and kind of understanding my own patterns, Mm -hmm. I don't panic as much. I know that I can sort of bring myself back um, into a more controlled state when I do get out of control. Um, There were two times where I felt like I couldn't. And at those two times I went into recovery programs. Um, So I was in eating disorder treatment twice. Um, But throughout my life, I've kind of developed my own way of dealing with, you know, that the feelings of being out of control. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's really where the control comes in and where I feel like I always fall back on some kind of um, structure to keep me safe. That's kind of been my pattern. Yes, yes, yes. And what does control mean to you? So I know that we said this, um, I wanted to explore this in our Instagram direct messages yesterday. And I was like, I have so many questions. I'm going to leave it (laughs) to this call. So in terms of losing control, what's the biggest fear you have around quote, losing control? So when I have gotten into binge cycles before, um, Usually it takes me a couple days to get out of it, but there have been times where I could get out of it for a day. I was back in it for two days, get out of it for a day, back in it for a couple days. So that makes me feel like I'm spiraling Mm -hmm. um, and I'm underwater. So I start to feel like I can't handle anything at that point. So that knowing that I can go there um, and that my weight can rapidly increase during those periods of time, that's probably the terror that lives underneath the structure. Yeah, and that's so valid. And of course, the fear of weight gain, I believe, is at the root of most of, you know, binge eating and emotional eating and all of those things, because we wouldn't have changed or tried to change our body all those years ago if we were happy with the skin we were in. We wouldn't be so worried about our food and what we're doing or not doing, or if it's right or wrong, if we weren't, if we were just completely okay with whatever our body's gonna be, our body's gonna be. So completely valid. I would like to ask you in terms of control, when you say you're petrified of losing control because you've had moments of experiencing that yourself in your life and it's very frightening for you, Mm -hmm. would you say that that is the amount that you lose control, would you say it's kind of to the same detriment as you were trying to control in the first place in regards to your dieting or restricting or mental restricting you're saying does it feel worse does it feel like 
because what I'm trying to explain is the bow and, al- bow and arrow analogy that I like to use. If you heard me explain that on one of my podcasts before, okay, this is game changer. You imagine, like I don't do a bow and arrow. I don't even know what the term's called, but you imagine you've got a bow, you've got an arrow and you're pulling it back, right? Let's say you're doing Atkins or the overeating anonymous, like abstinence from all sugar. Because of course I've been there, done that because I thought I was addicted to sugar. And you're pulling that bow back pretty hard is in terms of the restrictions quite severe however long you manage to hold that and pull that bow back inevitably you're going to let go because that's just the way the law of the universe works and the arrow is going to go as far in the other direction as the same detriment to what you were pulling it back in the first place does that make sense yes so if you were maybe practicing intuitive eating and then you put yourself on the intuitive eating diet which is why I'm not an intuitive eating coach specifically that might just be a little bit of a pull but not so much then the arrow going in the opposite direction might not be as severe depending on what's going on mentally as well there are a few layers to this so my question to you was the amount that you were pulling that bow and arrow back in terms of restriction the out of controlness of course the arrow being let go and going wherever it's going to go would you say it kind of matched the restriction you was doing before no in what way would it be different like completely over shooting per se yeah and this is where I struggle with the concept of intuitive eating because that has not been my experience. Um, my binges have varied in intensity, not based upon what, how much I was restricting actually. Um, but I am at a place now where it's not comfortable to me to follow an external set of rules. Like I do have a self-directed structure to my eating. Um, and I've pushed back against that for the last couple of years. Like I can't seem to follow someone else's plan. I don't want to. So there is part of me that is kind of fighting to be intuitive, but I never found that the binges necessarily were responsive to the restriction. They seem to be almost like a, like a volcano building in intensity. And I, I could resist it for a certain amount of time, maybe even a certain number of days. And then it would just catch me. Mm -hmm. Um, And that happened to me even when I was eating whatever I wanted uh, for a period of close to a year. And I put on 30 pounds in that period and was like happy and fat and doing (laughs) just like eating whatever I wanted. Um, But then, you know, it's interesting because maybe that was in response because before that I had been on bright line eating, which was super restrictive for a year and a half, maintaining a very low weight and then had done a program to resolve my SIBO, my digestive issues that ended with a seven day water fast and then two weeks of steamed vegetables only. And I was maintaining my lowest adult weight ever, which was 101 pounds. And I was literally looked starved. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was followed by a year and a half of gaining 35 pounds. And even though I had released all restriction and said it's all in, it did include binges towards the end of it. And that's what shocked me and put me back into an eating disorder treatment program because I was like, I'm still binging. I've released restriction, I put on weight, but that could, maybe that was the arrow returning from the water fast, I don't know. Yes, 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 your body is so smart. And often I see um, women with a story, not similar to yours, because everyone's different, but in terms of the length that they've been restricting, like from a six-year-old, that's a hell of a lot of time that you've been manipulated. Well, it wasn't your choice back then, of course, but that's a lot of time for your food to have been manipulated and then it being focused on your body. So whether or not we understand like what the hell's going on and part of my goal for this call is for us to understand actually what has and what is going on with your mindset and your body. I think our body knows what it's doing. And I've noticed myself, like I said, the longer the women have been restricting, not the longer recovery takes, but if you look at their reaction, their binges, their emotional eating, they do kind of match up if you were to like zoom out a little bit over time. And let's say, for example, looking at your water fast and then the vegetables, regardless of how long it, it how further in the future the reaction happened, you can start to like 
join the dots up a little bit. And we don't need to do that in order to move forward, but it can be very helpful to, to understand, oh, okay, so I was physically allowing, but why were the binges happening? But I have a few more questions around that. So for my first question, Cindy, is what do you define as a binge? What does that mean to you if you were describing it to an alien who had no idea what that was? Yeah. Um, so a binge for me now is different than it was in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but I just had one a day of binging recently, um, although with less um, panic around it, um, because I kind of felt like I allowed it in a way, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. But that's the evolution, right? But for me now, a binge is where I continue to eat throughout the day really constantly, like whenever I have an opportunity um, in secret, it's always in secret. Um, it feels very contrary to what my body wants. Um, it makes me feel bad physically. Mm -hmm. um, and I will eat the things that I don't ordinarily eat. So they will be highly palatable, convenience type foods. Um, and I eat much faster than usual. Mm. Is interest in the word shame that I want to use in regards to eating in secret, of course, do you have a lot of shame around that, I believe? Yes. yes. Yeah, which is a big red flag for me because that's mental restriction, which I want to go into in a moment. But if you think back to when you were physically allowing, you put on that weight, you were happy and fat. I love those words. <laughs> um, how was your mindset towards food? Would you eat in secret still when you had a quote binge? Was you judging yourself? Like, tell me what was going on more so in your head when you were experiencing those moments in that time. So I was eating a tremendous amount of calories, but I was hungry for it. So a couple of times I did check in and I'm like, I'm eating about 3000, 3,500 calories a day. And that was, I was eating, you know, with other people, I wasn't hiding it initially because I was still small. Mm -hmm. um, when I got up in weight towards the end of that year, that's when I started to feel worse about myself. I started thinking about how am I going to now rein this in? I started looking for the next solution, the next program. So while I was still eating the food, my mindset had shifted at that point. And that's when the things that were in the house that I was doing fine with before now became you know, I would eat half the cookie and go back and eat two more in secret. So mm -hmm. it just sort of snowballed back into binging. Yeah. And that makes so much sense because what I see is started off on the right track, so to speak, the weight was gaining slowly, but then you had a body image trigger or maybe triggers, mm -hmm. maybe one more than one, I'm sure that then sent you back into maybe future dieting, or even if it wasn't dieting, it was future. How can I eat less and still allow kind of thinking, which I used to do all the, I call it micro dieting. It's like the little sneaky, the voice that comes in, like I'm eating this chocolate because I'm allowing myself but I kind of wish I didn't want to eat this amount of chocolate. So in the future, I hope I don't eat this much anymore. So there's really tiny little mindset shifts that have a huge effect. And then it's just clear to see then after that, the secret eating came back because you had shame around that. So I see as a coach looking in, mental restriction is a big deal for you. And you have shame around the way you eat and shame around your body. So those two key things I would like to like dive into. So body image, obviously being the root main, mainly, but mental restriction, I think we need to talk about first because this is what is continuing with the binges. Do you agree with that reflection? Not sure that I agree about the mental restriction causing the binges. I, I literally feel like no matter what I've been doing in my life, mm -hmm. I could go a few months without it, but it always seemed to return. So there's a part of me that doesn't 100% believe that it's in response to restriction, even mental restriction, but the weight and body image stuff has been continuous throughout my life. So that has never changed. Yes. What do you think? I'm curious as what's your, what's your feeling to Actually, I don't think the mental restrictions causing me the binges. Like what is going on? Just explain that a bit more to me. 
because it does feel so detached from whatever it is I'm doing. Um, it just feels like something comes over me. Um, this is where I had a problem always with intuitive eating and maybe it's a lack of interoception, a lack of like being in touch with my own body, but I do feel like it's almost this just thing that happens to me. The like desire to binge, the never being satisfied that particular day when the day before I was perfectly satisfied and that pressure or like stress will just build up. And I, I don't know, maybe because I can't see it as a direct correlation to the restrictive thoughts or. Yeah, any form of restriction, in my personal and pre- professional opinion, causes an equal and opposite reaction. And our mind is so freaking powerful. I mean, I'm sure you know, with your degrees and all the things that you've been through in your life, I'm sure you know how powerful the mind is. And so what that means is if we're sat eating all the things and then judging ourselves for eating the thing, or even like a little, like I said, a little micromanaging diet thought, like I'm kind of not happy with the weight I'm putting on. So I'm hoping this doesn't continue because of your past history with all the restriction, your body's like, uh, uh-uh, there's no way we are going down that road again. So in order to quote, help you, which is, I know it's not helpful, but it's your biology that just takes over. It causes this, almost this, like how you describe it, like this out of control experience. I need to eat all the food now and I'm going to do it in secret because I'm a show ashamed of my actions. That's your biology taking over. And that's because your body doesn't feel safe that there's going to be enough food and on a consistent basis coming in. And this is where the work is so hard because your body can and will change because you'll probably gain more weight than your set point weight to begin with because your body's just protecting you and overcompensating for all the past restriction before because your body doesn't care if you want to be a size whatever. Unfortunately for us in this world, Mm -hmm. it cares about your survival. And so because you're judging your body, And of course you are because you live in this world. And if you've not done the deep, I'm not sure what body image work you've done, but if you've not consistently done a lot of body image and self-love work, it's going to be a trigger. And so that's what I see. I see mental restriction, biology taking over, you judging yourself for it, and then the cycle continues. So I'm not, well, I am disagreeing with you, but I'm not saying that what you're saying is, is not valid because it absolutely is. I'm just trying to see if that makes sense for you and if it doesn't of course it's absolutely fine the body image and actually the scale obsession I think is at the root and always has been for me the number has terrorized me my whole life more than even because when I look at pictures of myself now I think I look cute like I'm not critical I'm like oh you're so cute and little Like I actually, I'm extremely proud of where my body is today, you know, being my age and training consistently. Like I'm super proud of myself, but I don't like the number. It's not the number that throughout my life I was trying to hit. And when I did hit it, it still wasn't good enough. And then when I went below it, I was desperate to maintain it. But that number terrorizes me. Mm. what would you do do you think if your scale was taken away disappeared couldn't get one like how would you feel that's what they did to me in recovery I had to turn in my scale to the therapist I went and bought another one in secret I had to turn that one into my therapist (laughs) and then I automatically thought I was getting fatter every day when I didn't have the scale to check in Mm -hmm. and then that terrorized me And so actually I quit treatment against their advice this last time, the day she put me in front of a mirror and forced me to stand there and look at myself. And I was like, I can't do it Yeah. because I was convinced I was gaining weight throughout that period without having the ability to check the scale. Yeah. So the scale brings you some kind of safety and control and reassurance. And then the opposite of all of those comforting words all at the same time. Yes. Yeah, I remember speaking from experience when I was anorexic, I, I kind of loved being weighed and I would secretly, of course, all the medical professionals and my mom was praying that it would be higher. I would get on and then be like, yes, inside when it was lower. And 
the numbers meant so much to me. Mm -hmm. And if someone was, well, they did take that away. And it, I was still a child at that time. So I really didn't have much control over it. And I'm kind of glad I was a child because I just would have done exactly what you've done or have done in the past and continued weighing myself. Do you still weigh yourself now each day? So for the last 10 months, I've been working with an online coach. And so at a minimum, I was weighing myself once a week, but then my mind was like, well, maybe that day it was higher or lower. You should check in more than once. So I would check in, I would probably weigh myself three, four times a week. If I felt thin, I'd weigh myself. If I didn't, I wouldn't was generally, yeah. but yes, mm -hmm. I've been weighing myself a lot for the last 10 months. And what do you, what benefits do you get from doing that? And then what negatives come from doing that? It's negative, uh, whether it goes up or down. <laughs> um, so there's never a good number. <laughs> it's never the right number. Yeah, um, never enough. I feel like I walk around all day with a number floating over my head. So it completely changes how I feel about myself. I then become the number. Um, the days I don't weigh myself, I feel freer for sure. Not knowing the number, because then I can say, well, maybe it's down, but I just don't know. So that's good. Um, checking it though makes me feel like at least it's not going to get out of control again at least I'm managing it at least I'm keeping an eye on it um, because anytime I have gone long periods of time without weighing myself I was convinced I was gaining weight mm. I see you as a visual hanging on to a cliff edge with your fingernails and you think the scale the control the because you say the words control and out of control a lot and I see you hanging on and, and you think that the control is stopping you from falling. But my question is, when are you going to let go? When are you going to have had enough of clinging on to that cliff edge and being unhappy? See, there's a, a comfort in it, right? Um, this is what I know how to do. And can I tell you a little story? Please, of course. Just from this week. So I have three kids. Um, two are in high school, one is 20 years old. And my, I was having a really rough day with my 20 year old, very emotional. And I was going to prepare my lunch and methodically putting things on my food scale and weighing and measuring. And I got a text from my 15 year old saying, the two kids behind me are saying they're going to shoot up the school. And every alarm in my body went off, called the police, ran, got my two daughters, and then cried like big heaving sobs for an hour when I got home. And my lunch was still all set out on the counter that I was preparing. So, you know, I, I curled up in a ball and said, well, I'm not going to eat anymore today. And then I thought, no, 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 go ahead and eat. And I weighed out every single thing I was supposed to eat in that order and put it on the plate the way I always do. And it was the most comforting thing for me in that moment. And so throughout my life, I think this being in control actually allows me to deal with the stresses, the things that are so out of control. And I feel like if I gave that up, it would be too overwhelming. Like I just either I'd go back into a binge or I would, I don't know what, like, I just feel like it is, it has allowed me to sort of survive really difficult things in my life because it's, it's sort of footholds or ladders that I can hold on to through difficult times. Yeah. And I'm so sorry that that happened. And I'm, I'm taking that your daughters are okay. Yes. And it was, they, it was not an immediate threat. It was just talk. Thank God. But it was a really, really bad day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can imagine. So I'm just, you know, sending you my love for that experience. Thank you. And then with regards to the control, I completely can relate to you because it's your safety net, right? Mm -hmm. you've, done, you've been doing this for so many years. It's your safety net. If that wasn't available to you, and I think everyone's different. Most clients, I like to just go all in with the process that I teach. But if you and I were to work together or on this coaching call, for example, I would like to set little baby steps per se in the direction of freedom, because I always talk about nothing good happens in your comfort zone. You've got to get out of your comfort zone, but within your window of tolerance, because if the action step is going to overwhelm you so much and re-traumatize you, that's not going to help anybody. So it's it would be a case of I had a client similar to you before and she used to wait 
every single thing to the point where, and I'm sure you're the same because I used to be the same. If she was weighing spinach and there was one leaf that was like mm-hmm. one gram over, she would actually take the spinach leaf out the bowl. And I used to do that as well. So we started to swap weighing things for using spoons and serving Mm -hmm. sizes instead. So that was very traumatic for her, but she could do that, go through that with my support. So instead of weighing, I don't know, 40 grams of porridge oats, she would would get a scoop and know roughly how many grams, 40 grams were in terms of the scoop and then just use the scoop until she felt ready to. So those kind of little steps I think would benefit you in terms of weighing yourself I would recommend for you completely I know that's very anxiety provoking because if we said let's start with bi-weekly or twice a month or once a month there would be so much landing yeah. on that and because you know I've been there because if you leave it so long what if the scale then was heavier you'd freak the fuck out even more yeah. so and then be like told you it didn't work and then run back to the control so do you feel ready? Because you're a very intelligent lady, very intelligent. So you know intellectually that what you're doing isn't serving you. Yeah, and I do feel like I'm inching, I'm inching towards more freedom. Like yesterday, I didn't weigh any of my food. I just had, yeah, but I ate the kinds of meals that I'm used to eating. So they look the way I'm used to them looking. So that was okay for me to do. And like four months ago or three months ago, I mean, my husband decided every Saturday night is date night. I don't track that meal. I don't think about it. We just go out and we enjoy a meal. And that's huge for me coming from where I was before that. Mm -hmm. So like I am inching in that direction and I know the scale has to go next because that is, that tortures me. Yes acknowledging you for the steps you are making because it seems like your body as you said in a message similar to what you said your body is driving you or guiding you more so like with a gentle hand this is the way forward because otherwise you're literally going to be 90 counting almonds and weighing peanut butter yeah and that would be your reality if nothing changes and I know you know that so I think let's let's talk about body image then because Mm -hmm. this is of course, the route that's stopping you from maybe just going all in, continue with the baby steps you're making in terms of the food, congratulations for not weighing, even though your meals look the same, acknowledge yourself for that, because you didn't weigh them, so that was a big deal, so then, like, I would suggest to tomorrow have one meal that is slightly different, and then not weigh, maybe measure with a spoon if that brings you a bit more comfort and then gradually before you know it you'll start to feel safer eating more off-track meals and things like that but I think that will take time so continue with that for sure and let's face your fears head on then so what's your biggest fear around your weight and your body I think seeing myself during that year where I was eating so many calories and like my hunger or appetite frightens me. Mm -hmm. And I think because for so long, I've just followed quantity rules and and set meal times. So I'm so out of touch really with what I actually need or want. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the fear is really around like having a bigger appetite than the body I would like to have. <laughs> and so, you know, the calories just going up and up, um, that that scares me. Yeah. And what would be the worst thing about that? So if you did go all in, let go of that cliff that you're hanging on and just trust the fall and trust that you're going to land where you're supposed to land, what would be the worst case underneath that even? I do think my set point is bigger than where my body is now. um, And I don't like looking at myself like that. So it's important for me to be proud of myself and to feel good because for so long I've isolated because of wanting to control my food and just, you know, I've created such a small life for myself and I feel like it would get even smaller if I didn't like my weight or my size. So I don't want to make the situation worse. I want to make it better. And I want to feel proud of myself. Like, I think the step for me now is to get rid of the small clothes that are in bins that I'm waiting to fit into. Mm. But I definitely don't want to get into bigger clothes. Like, I feel like if I can learn to live in the skin I'm in, which is, 
you know, probably 10 to 15 pounds more than I thought I wanted to be, that would be a huge step for me. But if I do go all in and start eating more calories and putting on weight, it, I think it's going to make my life worse. So you're living in the belief at the moment that gaining weight means you'll keep yourself smaller. You'll never love and accept yourself. And so actually you may as well choose control with a smaller body than freedom with a bigger body and an even smaller life. Well, what does freedom mean, right? Because if, if I feel less free in a bigger body, then that's not a victory. So I'm looking for some kind of middle where (laughs) I'm not, you know, working so hard to maintain the body I'm in, but at the same time, I'm not, you know, getting to a place where I'm uncomfortable looking at myself. Yes. So my question to you is, are you willing or open to be wrong about the belief we've just discovered in terms of your bigger body? Because what you do, you don't know what you don't know yet. But I've been in that body, so I know what it feels like. (laughs) But what work have you done around self-acceptance, self-love, body image, and you still have a lot of restriction mentally going on? and fear of potential weight gain and the the control was still there. I resisted that work. That was, so that was really where my therapist was trying to go towards the tail end of this recovery stint. And that was my wall. Like I couldn't, I couldn't accept myself at that size, which really was only about five or six pounds more than I am now, but it felt so much more at the time. Um, And I think my body composition was different then too, but I resisted that work so much. Like that's, if, if there's a place to go there, I think that's an important place, but I guess I'm doubtful that I can do that because it's just been so many years of programming. Yeah. Oh, there is, but you, you, it is possible to change. It won't be easy, but it is absolutely possible. And there will be a period and I can speak again from experience of really uncomfortable, difficult times where you, where I personally kept thinking this, fuck this, I'm going back to dieting because I just cannot deal. And then I would go back to dieting for a while. And then I'll be like, okay, this is why I don't diet because I've just reminded myself again, why I stopped dieting all those years ago. And it took me a while of in the diet door, in the freedom door, like to and fro in, until one point I was like, excuse my language, fuck this. Do you know what? I am so done with obsessing over my body, over my weight, over my food, just completely done. And yes, I do not know what the future holds. And I reached out for help because I could not have done that alone, but I'm done. And I'm going to write myself a big letter, writing down all the reasons why I'm done. And I must have read that letter about 50 times in the first few months of recovery, because our brain likes to forget and only remember the fantasy and the reminisce of, oh, we're dieting was brilliant because I was in a smaller body. And then all the reasons why we diet in the first place. And I know that, you know, all the validation that comes from that. Interestingly enough, I want to ask you about the word proud. For, for you to, to be proud of yourself is a big deal for you. Mm-hmm. What does that mean to you when you say, I want to be proud of my body in the way it looks or something else? the discipline around everything that I do in terms of training and you know the food and like I do feel like my body type on my father's side of the family the women are all big Mm -hmm. and I completely have their body type so I feel like the, the pride is I manage my body in a way that it wouldn't look if I just ate whatever I wanted and that you know, I can see muscle definition and, you know, I'm getting stronger. And like uh, that all gives me a tremendous sense of pride. Like there are a lot of things in my life that I feel like I'm not proud of Um, my career and like the direction that's gone. I'm just not proud of it. It's not something that I wake up in the morning excited to do. Um, But I wake up excited to ride the Peloton or go to the gym or And that gives me a sense of pride. And so my body reflects hard work. That's what I feel like. Mm. And why does it matter to you that people see, wow, Cindy's so disciplined and she must work really hard for that body. Why does that matter so much to you? 
I'm not sure it's about people. I think it's about me. Like I care. I don't think anybody else gives a shit, honestly. And I don't think I looked very different. 10 pounds up, 10 pounds down. Like, I don't think anybody notices. I don't see people much. Like, my husband doesn't give a shit. He sleeps till 9.30. Like, he doesn't care. He eats whatever he wants, you know? Like, nobody in my life, really. Maybe my mother and my sisters. That's kind of the the childhood. Um, My sisters were both heavy and both either became anorexic or orthorexic and have stayed tiny, 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 like, throughout their lives they both got very very big when they were teenagers and managed it down to small so we were raised with this my mother was naturally thin and she didn't mean any harm by it she's old school Israeli and it was just her mouth was constantly comments about our bodies Mm -hmm. and we all just learned ways to manage it so when I'm with them I do care about my body size a lot Um, Mm -hmm. but I don't think the rest of the world gives a shit to be honest Yeah, I'm glad that you can see that because that is the truth. And also people judge people all the time for good, for bad, for neutral. It's going to happen all the time. So let's just focus on how you feel about towards yourself then with that, with the word proud. Why does it matter that you feel proud in terms of your aesthetic appearance? Because, of course, proud can with your work you've shared, that's probably a little bit of a sign. If you can't be proud there, then at least you can be proud here. So that's something to look at in the bigger picture to actually live your passion and live your life every day if anything was possible, because I believe anything's possible. That's another story for another time. But what about being proud of yourself in terms of how you take care of yourself, how you nourish yourself, how hard you train regardless of how you look aesthetically like can you go one layer deeper as to why you need to look in the mirror and see like definition or toned body or whatever it is you want to see I mean the only thing I can think of and what keeps coming up when you ask me that is about the shame right so because I have this history of binge eating because it started at such a young age I think it's it's the the discipline is the opposite of that, right? So there's the shame around having this issue that being Mm -hmm. out of control. And so when I look at myself and I see that I have muscle, I'm not overweight, those kinds of things, then, then I'm proud because it shows not only like, I'm not a normal person training. Like I have this history of binge eating. So I could get big very easily and I manage it. And so to me, it's like you, you're disciplined, you're not shameful, you're not out of control, like you've, you've created this in your life, this structure that allows you to have this body. And that gives me a sense of pride. Mm. So it's like a protective mechanism to stop yourself from maybe feeling what's really going on underneath it all. Maybe I think I'm always preparing for the next binge. Yeah. All everything that I do, and I, I had this conversation with my husband. Like, I think I always slightly under eat because I always know the binge is coming. So, whether it's a week away, a month away, or six months away, there's going to be a time again where I eat too much. So, I've got to always be preparing for that. So, my whole life's about preparing for the next binge, basically. Yeah. And as a coach, I don't care about what you eat or what you don't eat, I care about how you feel about what you eat or don't eat and how would you how would you react to my comment regarding the word control it's not about controlling your food it's about taking the power back from food because we can't actually control our food or our bodies we just think we can because we're animals human animals basically yeah no I don't see it (laughs) So when you say things like out of control, I need to control at the minute in quotes, you're kind of successful at controlling because you do have moments of out of control, but then you control again. So it's almost like the pendulum swing is going one way, but then you get it. So it's like a constant pull, push, pull, push, bow and arrow, get the arrow back, like constant, like the cycle, which you you know for well. So the scary part, and I know you've experienced this, but I still encourage, this needs to happen. You need to drop the fucking bow and arrow, drop the control, let yourself fall off the cliff, but you need to be ready to do this and be fully ready 
to go on this journey, definitely in terms of self-love and body image, knowing that it doesn't just mean you will put on weight forever and ever and ever and never stop eating because it, it won't. You've had that experience because you've still been controlling and restricting mentally. See, the, the other thing that comes up for me as you're saying that is I'm so skilled at substitution with foods. It's so automatic to choose mm -hmm. the high volume, lower calorie version of everything that I don't even know what you're saying to me. Like, I don't even know what that would look like. Like, does you know... Does that mean I don't eat the, you know, whatever I go to the full fat version or the full calorie version? Like, why would I do that? I get the same satisfaction. Like who cares, right? I can manage my weight better this way. So it's such a, to me at this point in my life, it feels like an impossible request almost to just release. I don't even know what that means to just not, not manage yeah. my food that way. And it's interesting that you automatically jump to swapping all of your whole food and diet up to all full fat stuff, eating all the things that you've previously banned yourself. You, you get to decide what food freedom looks like to you. So if you and I did work together or we were having more calls than just this one, I would be really curious to see, right, okay, first of all, change nothing about your diet, but stop measuring it. So mm -hmm. eat the same foods in the same kind of portions without measuring it to the gram definitely don't weigh yourself ever again. And if you ever want to weigh yourself, I want you to write me a long letter as to why you won't still not be weighing yourself, but it will help you to get pen and paper and be like, I need to weigh myself because, and then you'll realize that actually there's no, there's never going to be a good enough reason for you to step on those scales. Instead, I would like you to take care of yourself take care of yourself emotionally when you're feeling that desperate urgent need to weigh yourself is to come back to yourself like practice I mean I have heard time and time again breathing techniques that just does not do it for me it makes my breathing worse still to this day so that doesn't work for me dancing works for me with my earphones in whether it's angry dance slow dance whatever I feel in the moment so explore get to know Cindy like, what does Cindy need to be comforted? You are so strong and the feelings that you're scared of feeling, the out of controlness, you're strong enough to be with that without taking the action of weighing or the control action. But you've That's got- That's what I've no never been successful at. Like I, I have managed short periods of time to, and in Overeaters Anonymous, you had to make a phone call when you were having urges. So that created a pause necessarily and talking to someone was helpful, but it was only temporary and it would come back and come back and, and sort of haunt me until I gave into it. So that I have not found a way to like long-term really dismiss urges. And if I could figure that out and have confidence that I would not go back there, I think everything would be easier. Like it'd be easier to give up so much control. Yes, but with regards to overeating and ominous, you're stopping the urge of actually eating. So that's restriction. Well, is it restriction though, if you know that it's just habit, it's just the thought comes up habitually, but there's no appetite around it. There's no physical need for the food, but it's just a habitual thought. I mean, I don't think food freedom is every time you think about wanting to eat, you go eat. Like oh, every time oh, you yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, you do, young lady. I, I tried not to interrupt, but yes, restriction. If you are not hungry and you, someone with a brownie walks past you or a cookie van or whatever it is your thing, and your body's like, hey, I would love one of them. And you're like, nope, you're not hungry. That's restriction. So I'm so glad that I can, because this is where you're going quote wrong. And I know your brain's going to be like, Victoria, I think you're talking a load of BS. Like, what are you saying? But this is the mental restriction. So any form of restriction, and I will say this till I'm blue in the face, any form of restriction will create an equal and opposite reaction. So overeating and ominous, when you're calling someone up to try and resist the urge to eat sugar or bread, regardless of whether you're full from a really healthy, nourishing meal, that's still restriction. There's a reason why you're having that urge. Your body is so freaking smart. Yeah, that's where I lose you because <laughs> I feel like it's just a pattern. It's just a, it's just a, 
it's like, have you read Brain Over Binge? Oh, yes. And I've listened to all the podcasts and all of the things. And again, I thought, okay, this is the answer. I'll just do all the mindset stuff. Yeah. It doesn't work. And also habits. Yes, I've read multiple habit books. James Clear is, Mm -hmm. um, is a great book. But also the way we form a habit is because we get pleasure out of it. So yes, habits are habits for a reason, but there's a reason why you're still doing that habit. You're getting pleasure out of that thing. Restriction Mm -hmm. creates a reaction. Allowance creates space for choice. So you allow, 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 and then you're like, okay, I'm still not really happy with this habit I have at eating chocolate every night, but because I'm not making myself wrong for it, I'm not judging myself for it, I'm allowing it, Let's just tweak a few things to see maybe, shall I eat a different brand of more nourishing chocolate? Shall I swap it for this instead? Only from that place of non-judgment can you change a habit. Any kind of restriction and judging the shit out of yourself around it is going to keep you in the same cycle. I get that part. But I guess I... I guess it's about willingness, right? I I feel like... uh, there was a point where I was willing to do that, but I'm not now. Like, I'm not willing to just say every time I think about a food, I'm going to eat it. Mm. And this is what, of course, that you've come to this call for to see whether you're at a crossroads now. And I'm, it's so beautiful that your body is very gently and very slowly leading you down more of a free path. And maybe it's not in this lifetime that you will be in full food and body freedom and that's okay I want that for you because I know how liberating and free that is and I can tell you it's fucking hard I'm not even gonna lie but now it's not Mm -hmm. and you can see this is why I've chosen to to live my passion and teach this to women I know what it feels like to be not exactly where you are because I'm not you but I've had very similar kind of experiences for many years not as many years but for many years and I know the the grips of the control and it just overtakes your whole entire life and the unknown is so scary and every single cell of your being is telling you not to go down that path because it doesn't want to go down the unknown abusive people who are abused stay in abusive relationships myself included because it's comforting even though you're getting raped and hit every day but then there comes a time and there's no right or wrong. I just want what's best for you. And you can take it as slow or as fast as you like, where you have to look at yourself in the mirror and think, what do I really want for myself and my life? Because if I continue as I am, nothing's really going to change. Or, and I am at that point. Yeah. I am at that point. What do you want most? I don't want to care about the scale and I don't want to weigh and measure my food. Hmm. So that was a clear answer for you. So all the resistance that you have right now, of course, you're going to have so much resistance because that's been your identity for so many years. And without bringing your past into it, because this is going live, you've been through a lot of shit that's nothing to do with food as well. Yes. So it's about meeting yourself with compassion. I mean, you've probably done or I'm just guessing a lot of therapy in a child work, trauma release, all of those, all of those things, which is definitely necessary. Trauma is stored in the body. And yes, we can work through it and release it, but your body never forgets either. So it's working with you as a whole, meeting yourself with compassion for everything you've been through and deciding, I choose me right now and I am no longer going to control and to hold on and I'm getting emotional and I always get emotional when I talk about this stuff because I remember I remember it like it was yesterday how small that world is but you feel like there's no way out because it's all you know there's the way out I promise you and if you want it you absolutely can have it you've just got to face a lot of fears along the way I think that what keeps coming up for me as you're talking is trust because I so desperately right now want to trust myself which is why I'm very hesitant to do any kind of program or I, I've constantly sought out the next guru to fix me. Mm-hmm. And I'm just at this place now where I just have this like internal desire to like hear my own voice, but I don't trust it. So like, that's, that's the struggle. Yeah. 
Can you think of a time, three times, I would like you to give me it as an example, where it can be anything in your life. It doesn't have to be around food, body. It can be anything where you felt that self-doubt, trusted yourself anyway, and it's worked out for the best. No. <laughs> um, I guess one thing was... Um, I took three years where I didn't practice law and I was just teaching yoga and meditation. Mm -hmm. And I went back to sort of the mothership of yoga where I had gone when I was a teenager for my advanced training. And it was so healing for me. And during that period of time, I just think it was almost like I gave myself a rest mm -hmm. um, until I went back to restrictive eating. So like during that, I really allowed myself quite a bit of time in my life where I took my foot off the pedal. I didn't have a high driving career. I wasn't on a strict schedule. I took naps every afternoon. Um, and that was against, you know, everything everybody told me I was supposed to be doing, but my husband sort of created the space and said, just take the time. That's beautiful. And I see as clear as day that your body is desperate for you to come home to yourself in every way because your body is longing for you to trust her because she has the answers. She does. And are you spiritual, Cindy? I struggle with that. I do, I struggle with that. Um, I think I'm very disconnected right now, but there have been times I've been more spiritual. Yeah, and I understand part of the disconnection may be, and this isn't just to keep slating overeating and ominous, although I know I am, is because <laughs> they use spirituality in the terms of like abstain, abstinence and all of that. So you're going to have a warped kind of relationship with that because it's so confusing to you. Like, how can it be helping you to stop eating the evil sugar? And, and I say that in quotes for the podcast, by the way, the evil sugar and bread. And then now I'm bringing maybe the conversation of spirituality into coming home to yourself and trusting everything that is going on for you. Because I promise you, if you, even if you can't feel it yet, you can trust yourself. Your heart beats for you every day since the day you were, well, before you were born, since the day you was conceived, your heart's beating for you, keeping you alive. When you're cold, your body lets you know, and then off you go and get a jumper or put the heating on. When you need a wee, if you can, you nip to the loo. You know, all these natural biological instincts that we do without thinking about it, we don't even think, wait, do I trust my body because she's saying I'm cold? Let me just check for goose pimples. You just cold and you get something. That's how we were when we were first born in regards to food. Believe it or not. I know it sounds like such a crazy concept to believe. Your body knows we're in our heads from the brainwashing. And I know you know this, so it doesn't make it better just because we know. But from the second we're out the womb, because your mum and your mum's mum and your mum's mum would also have been brainwashed. You can't trust yourself. You need to buy this product. Mm -hmm. You also need to buy this product because sugar is addictive and all the things that we end up believing. And then what we believe about ourselves, we attract into our lives. So if you believe sugar is addictive, your unconscious mind will go and find experiences for you to go. Yep, I know it's addictive. This is where the body image work is so magic. We attract what we believe about ourselves. So if you believe that if you're at a certain weight, you cannot and will not be happy and accept yourself and you'd rather be controlling, that's what you'll attract into your life. If you, all you have to do is create the tiniest possibility, which I will help you to create because I'm so fucking invested in every single person I work with. I just can't help it. A tiny, you know, did you ever play make-believe when you were... A child, I used to say to, well, not a child, a teenager, or even as a young adult, what would you do if you'd won the lottery? And then we'll be like, well, the first thing I'd do is I'd buy this house or I'd buy a pony or whatever I'd do. And in the moment of make believe, it just felt so light and carefree because it's all make believe. It's just something nice to think about. Your homework, Cindy, is to write on the top of the paper make believes so then your 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 mind won't have too much resistance because you're playing make believe so it's safe to do so what would it be like if i genuinely loved my body 
and I ate what I want when I wanted, what would my life be like? Let's just play make-believe. I, I would have the space to go back to school and have a career that I love and, you know, take up the hobbies that I wanted to take up so many times, but I just never had the time and space to do it. Um, but I don't believe it's possible for me. That's at the root of all of this is that I believe I'll still end up binging. Mm. And when we can change that belief, because let me ask you something about beliefs, you know, your children, mm -hmm. do you believe that you love them or you just know that you love them? I know. So a belief, no matter how true it feels, can be changed. Mm -hmm. You can't change the love for your children because whether they piss you off or whatever it is they do, <laughs> you love them unconditionally with every cell of your being. You believe at the moment that that's not possible for you. The only thing I ask for you to be open to before you start this journey, if and ever you so choose to start it, is... Are you willing to be wrong about believing that belief? Not how, just are you willing to be wrong that you will indeed live a binge-free life? Yes. So fucking how. Yes. <laughs> that's all I that's all you need. Literally, that is all you need. That's an easy yes. There you go. <laughs> That was easier than I thought to get from you because <laughs> that's all you need is that little spark of desire. And your body's wisdom, my coaching will do the rest. And we're going to end there, but we'll have a continue our conversation after I've stopped recording. But for the listeners listening, thank you. And Cindy, what have you taken away from this conversation? Some hope. Thank you for being so open and thank you for being honest as well. And thank My you. For, thank you for having me. No, you're welcome. Thank you for listening, Queen. See you next time. <laughs>